thank you for the invitation to the seminar. Um, so as mentioned, I'll be talking about quasi-polynomial bounds on the inverse theorem for the Gower's norms. And also, since this is more of a number theory seminar, talk about you know, some applications that crop up when, when looking at number theory, prime numbers in particular. Um, and everything that I'm going to talk about in terms of uh, results is joint work with James Lang, who's a, at UCLA, and Natap Sani, who's at, also at MIT. All right. So uh, usually when I talk about the inverse theorem or additive combinatorics, I'll often start with a discussion of some Reddy's theorem. Here, I'll sort of take a, a bit of a different tack and, and, and talk specifically about um, related types of notions, but really regarding patterns of prime numbers specifically, rather than uh, generic sets of numbers as we study in additive combinatorics. So uh, one sort of classical uh, study is looking at equations involving prime numbers, twin primes, gold box conjecture, et cetera, looking for patterns among prime numbers and, and so on. And one of the sort of uh, most classical results in this vein is this result of Vinogradov showing that every sufficiently large odd number is the sum of three primes. So the, the weak Goldbach conjecture, sort of using, you know, by now very standard circle method techniques and introducing Vinogradov's estimate, um, which basically, in some sense, computes the Fourier coefficients of the von Mangold function and establishing cancellation uh, for, for it. And sort of using those estimates and sort of in a very similar tack using Fourier analysis, uh, van der Korpet uh, soon after established that there are uh, infinitely many uh, triples of distinct pr pr primes satisfying the equation p plus q equals 2r, or equivalently uh, a three-term arithmetic progression of prime numbers. So, of course, this is a very natural result and a very nice result to, to, to want to see. And you could ask, okay, can we uh, extend our progressions further? Can we find other types of patterns among prime numbers, et cetera? Um, and this is sort of a very classical question that was, that was asked many times. So, um, there are, you know, some intervening results that I'll sort of skip over, but essentially, you know, using some sieving tools and other types of techniques, you can basically show that you can get, um, arbitrarily long, like, you know, hundred term arithmetic progressions, as long as you're willing to look at almost primes instead You say, okay, I, you know, have at most so many prime factors or, you know, some other types of conditions. Um, and perhaps the closest, uh, that was really got towards establishing a bona fide progression, longer progression of prime numbers is this result of Heath Brown, um, a, a very nice result showing that up to one semi prime, uh, you can have, you know, you know, arbitrarily many four term arithmetic progressions of prime numbers. But sort of looking at longer, you know, arithmetic progressions or more complicated patterns was uh, mostly, you know, not really able to be approached with some exceptions. So there's this nice result of Balog in the 90s that shows that you can find uh, let's say M primes, M is, you know, a thousand or, you know, some fixed number, you can find this many primes such that every average of the two is still a prime number. So kind of like an extension of van der Korpet's result in sort of a different direction. Um, rather than longer progressions, we sort of have many interlinked three-term arithmetic progressions prime numbers. And of course, you could ask for more general like linear patterns or maybe even polynomial patterns. There's sort of a, a broad conjecture one can make um, called like Schindel's hypothesis and and related things that um, you know would be really deep if one could establish, but of course that that's very far far off. And included among this is stuff like twin primes that you'd want to know, um, where instead of having these homogeneous equations, maybe I you know have like a, a shift as well, like n and n plus two. So one sort of uh, key result in really getting towards uh, a deeper understanding of these patterns um, was this result of Green uh, in around two thousand three. Uh, ben Green, um, where he showed that, um, okay, van der Korpet says you have infinitely many triples of distinct primes satisfying these, uh, this equation. Well, Green asks, well, what if I give you, you know, some special subset of prime numbers? Um, so, I mean, one sort of natural thing you could ask for is, you know, primes in an arithmetic regression that you can sort of just, you know, modify van der Korpet's method. But, you know, maybe I have primes in certain Chebotarov classes or other types of positive density subsets of primes where it's not as obvious. And Green established that any positive density subset of prime numbers, completely arbitrary, it doesn't even have to have a nice algebraic or number theoretic uh, justification for it. Any such set, we can find infinitely many three-term arithmetic regressions of prime numbers. And um, here, he really needs to introduce something a little bit beyond just the standard Fourier techniques that we've seen so far, um, introducing these so-called restriction estimates. 
but even then up until this point, we, we mostly see these sorts of uses of sieving and Fourier analysis um, or the circle method as it's often referred to in number theory. So soon after Green and uh, Tau established the, the Green-Tau theorem, which I'm sure you guys know, you have arbitrarily long arithmetic regressions of prime numbers. And in fact, again, similar to this prior Green result, if I give you an arbitrary positive density subset of prime numbers, I can still establish the same. So this is quite a powerful result. And it introduces a lot of techniques from what is sort of now called higher order Fourier analysis. And um, at least sort of skimming through some of the, the number theory papers that I saw that sort of use some related techniques. I, I saw this at one point referred to as a nilpotent circle method, which I think is sort of, um, in a sense, kind of representative of, of what it's about. And I'll soon talk later, there have been future works such as so-called linear equations in the primes by Green Tau and, and Green Tau Ziegler, which um, establish basically more complicated linear equations. Not everything, like it doesn't show twin primes or bounded gaps, but but a, a quite broad set of things that has them up. Are there any questions about uh, this history so far though? And admittedly, it's a bit biased towards uh, this particular uh, set of problems. All right, so uh, let me just briefly sort of talk about more general linear patterns and Green and Tau sort of established this result conditionally, conditional on what I'm talking about, the inverse theorem for the Gower's norms. And then Green, Tau, Ziegler were the ones to, to establish those inverse theorems in full. So basically we let capital Psi be a system of affine linear forms with integer coefficients, integer you know, constant coefficient as well. Um, there's a notion of complexity that I'm not going to quite get into, but let's assume the complexity is finite. Then as long as, you know, I don't have the linear form 2x or something, I don't have these weird mod constraints, or I'm not like forcing these to be negative numbers or something like that. So up to some modular and Archimedean constraints, which can be captured by some sort of, uh, you know, product at places or something, um, there are infinitely many choices of, of input um, in you know, the input space Z to the D, such that every single linear form is fine. And as I sort of alluded to, in fact, you have a sort of a generalized party Littlewood conjecture in the sense that you can give a count of the number of N that really satisfy this. And uh, it sort of is on the scale that you expect based on the propensity of prime numbers to exist at one over log N and so on and so forth. So here, finite complexity, th there's a, precise quantitative notion of complexity um, to give it particular numbers. And there are a couple of notions, but for our purposes, we only really care about finite complexity. And so basically you're going to have finite complexity if none of uh, these pairs of affine linear forms are affine transformations of each other. So as sort of the quintessential example and the example which would immediately apply the Green Tau theorem, this being a more general theorem, if we look at the this series of forms in the variables X and Y, uh, none of these are affine transformations of each other. And uh, it has finite complexity. And in fact, um, it sort of has so-called true complexity, uh, K minus two. On the other hand, uh, this sort of bounded gaps type thing, uh, twin primes, X and X plus two, X and X plus two are affine linear transformations of each other. So it's going to have complexity infinite. So, in order to establish this result, as I said, um, in 2006, Green and Tau sort of established it conditional on some conjectures. Um, one has to do with the decorrelation of the, uh, the von Mangold or Mobius with uh, so-called uh, nil characters, which you can think of as, again, higher order Fourier characters, and also um, you know, conditional on uh, the inverse theorem for the Gower's norms. And here, there's actually a particular level of Gower's norms that you need related to the complexity of the system. And we'll talk a bit more about this, this later. But this is sort of, you know, um, in terms of finding primes in very ge generic linear constrained situations, other than, you know, these, these great results about bounded gaps and stuff like this, this is really the statement that, you know, encapsulates uh, the, the state of knowledge and, and, and gives you it for basically everything that doesn't have some sort of twin primes type thing showing up. Um, among linear forms. So are there any questions about this statement? All right. 
So let me maybe just uh, wrap up the introductory section by, by talking a bit more about some applications of higher order Fourier analysis, and then I'll try to sort of go into it and motivate it a bit and show how, you know, it can really crop up in a natural way when you're thinking about the circle method or uh, more related types of things, um, even in number theory. So um, sort of uh, one notable work um, more recently is this work of Tao and Teravainen, where they basically um, use certain quantitative bounds for the inverse theorem that was established by Manners in 2018. And they use that instead of, um, you know, the prior result and really give these quantitative results um, for, for example, the count for the generalized hardy Littlewood um, sort of result that was proven before it was like a one plus little o one. And instead they get some sort of uh, small polynomial of log log uh, for counting linear equations and primes and, you know, related types of things about, you know, how so-called uniform the Mobius and von Neumann functions are. So that's more of a sort of basic extension in a sense. I'm not really branching out a lot, um, but you know, there's also this nice work of Teravainen about if I want to establish or some control over what the Louisville or Mobius function looks like when I take a polynomial sequence and plug in values, maybe I want to show something about sign changes or, or other types of things. You can start to get some control if you know how these, these functions behave with respect to, you know, more complicated things and just Fourier coefficients and, there, there's a lot of work um, in similar veins where using um, ideas about decorrelation with uh, Mobius against so-called nil characters um, can tell you a bit more than just the Fourier coefficients would, um, this sort of classical bound of being a graph. This one is a bit uh, further from my area of expertise, um, but there's this uh, work by Harpaz, Goro, Bogatov, and Wittenberg where they sort of use uh, linear equations and the primes to talk a bit about uh, what they call the hardy little conjecture and rational points. And here I'm, you know, not really on this side of algebraic number theory or, or arithmetic geometry, but my understanding is um, they're looking at stuff like Brouwer, Manin obstructions and, and sort of Hasse um, principles in some types of curves and to really establish some type of um, equivalence or you know, necessity or whatever. They really want to know something about the existence of primes that have certain properties at certain places and otherwise are, are mostly just, you know, touching one further place. Like, so you basically have some system of primes that satisfy some nice types of constraints. Um, and I need some parameters that really um, create all of these primes at once. And so I need to be able to construct something with which satisfy all these linear equations. Prior to this linear equation, the primes result, again, such a thing might be conditional on some sort of Schindel hypothesis um, about you know, obtaining prime values of polynomials or multiple polynomials. But if, if you have this available uh, machinery and result of, of Greentown, Greentown Ziegler, you can sort of do it and, and plug and play and, you know, get these things and then, you know, do whatever algebra you want to do beyond that point, which I admittedly am not really an expert in. And finally, an, another paper that I saw that was of some interest is you can, you know, you don't just have to look at prime numbers or movies involving one male functions. You can look at things like representation functions for uh, binary quadratic forms or other types of things and, you know, look at patterns among those. And if you're interested in studying, you know, norm forms or other related things, uh, achievable values, patterns among them, you can use these types of things, not just for prime numbers, but more general sets or even weighted sets of, of numbers and, and functions. And, you know, potentially say things of interest about them. All right, so here are just you know some of the more more number theoretic um, applications and directions that have been taken. One sort of final thing that I'll mention is sort of uh, beyond this tau teravainen result. Again, sort of the title of this talk is quasi polynomial bounds for the inverse theorem. So you might expect that you know some improvements might be made, and in fact um, James Lang uh, showed sort of that those uh, improved bounds that I'll be talking about. Um, can be used to get uh, a much better account and a much better Gower's uniformity for Mobius and Mangold, namely a log n to the negative a type error, where this a is really in the sense of Siegel's theorem. So you can get as big of an a as you want, but you have to you have to pay this pay this cost of having an ineffectiveness from uh, Siegel zeros or the Siegel zero argument. All right. So let me now talk a bit about. Um, how we motivate the study of higher order Fourier analysis and how sort of give a sort of schema for how you might see um, applications of it 
in practice beyond just using these results as black boxes, of course, um, as we've seen in some other things. So to sort of start, I'm going to contrast with sort of the regular circle method, regular Fourier analysis. Um, here I'm going to sketch this van der Korpet result about three term arithmetic progressions of prime numbers. But really, if you want, you can just think about Vinogradov's classic argument. Um, and it's basically the same. And I'll make some modifications just to make my life easier with notation and to make it more in line with how we think about things from an additive combinatorics perspective. But again, you should really think that it's, it's very much the same. So let's look at the prime numbers from one to n. And so this is just a zero one value function, but I'm just gonna make the code in the complex numbers. And this is something we commonly do in additive combinatorics. This will just make my life easier so I don't have to think about real Fourier coefficients. Um, so I'm just going to take some prime number between 4n and 8n and basically just extend my function to be defined on z mod n tilde z instead. We want to count three term arithmetic progressions of prime numbers, which are sort of encapsulated by this indicator function f. And okay, depending on how you count them up to like a factor of two or whatever, and maybe you're including trivial progressions as well. Um, x over n tilde squared is going to equal this expectation. So this is just an average over possible values of x and d ranging over z mod n tilde of this triple product, which encodes that each of these numbers is in our set of prime numbers. OK, let's use uh, Fourier inversion. So I'm going to use it on each term individually and get theta 0, theta 1, theta 2 on the corresponding terms. I'm just going to expand it out. OK, so since I decide to work over z mod n tilde z, um, things become a little easier. And I can actually just say, OK, this if I bring this average um, inside, then you can see that the only term that is really being averaged is an exponential term. And it's a linear exponential. It's a geometric series. I mean, it's even a character on z mod n tilde z. So I know precisely when that average is 0 and when that average is 1. And it's precisely when, basically, this linear equation up here is equal to zero identically. And so if we just solve it, we let theta be theta zero. The only way for the Fourier coefficients to be multiplied by a non-zero average is if we have these particular terms, f hat of theta, f hat of negative two theta, and f hat of theta once more. And I realize here that I can just drop the expectation as well. All right. So now, at this point, we've written things in terms of Fourier coefficients. And if you consolidate these terms, this should look quite familiar. It's like an f hat squared times f hat of negative 2 theta. And with Vinogradov, maybe you see like a, you know, something similar. Um, now, we use the circle method, which really means, OK, we have these major arcs and we have these minor arcs. Um, and I'm just going to sort of say how you bound the minor arcs here. So the minor arcs are basically going to be the set of values of theta for which the Fourier coefficient is small. Um, and again, if we were doing some of the real numbers, this would be things that are sort of far from uh, small denominator rational numbers, similar to how Vinogradov does it. And here we can just say, OK, I have this sort of sum, and I have an L2 right here, and I have sort of a remaining term that I can bound by the L infinity over here, and I get an inequality like so, when I also use Plancharel or Parseval to go from the L2 norm of f hat to the L2 norm of f. And OK, here, maybe this should be f hat of negative 2 theta, but it turns out you can prove this inequality as well if you use Cauchy-Schwartz uh, judiciously. So this will basically let you establish that the minor arcs correspond to some sort of error term. And then you just need to compute and add up the contribution from the major arcs. So this is just the classical hardy littlewood uh, circle method, maybe adapted a little bit just to sort of show how we think about it in additive combinatorics. So now the natural question is, OK, why don't we just do this for you know higher progressions? We want a pattern of prime numbers. Uh, why don't we just do the same thing? And obviously, I mean, there's like a, many years that people couldn't do it. So there's going to be some obstruction, but let's really illustrate what that obstruction is going to be. So let's look at k-term progressions. Um, and at some point, I think I'll specialize to k equals 4. Um, but basically, we look at the same average, same f, let's say, morally. Um, or roughly the same f. And instead of just x, x plus d, x plus 2d, we have all the way up to x plus k minus 1 plus d. We need all of those to be in our side of prime numbers. And then we use Fourier inversion 
we get a vector theta with k coordinates theta zero to theta k minus one, and we basically get just the same. Okay. And now again, in order for there to be a non-trivial contribution from certain Fourier coefficients, we need this linear form here in the exponent to be identically zero. Okay. So here, this corresponds to having the sum of theta and the sum of j theta, I guess, to equal zero. And these are linearly independent equations. And so if we have k variables, we're going to have k minus two degrees of freedom. So when k equals three, we just had one theta parameter to work with. When k equals four, we're going to have two theta parameters to work with. And one way of parameterizing the solutions to this equation is, I believe, like so. Um, perhaps the coefficients are slightly incorrect. No, they look good. Um, and so now you have these two parameters, and you have this sort of fourfold product, and it's not really clear what to do anymore. Um, I did sort of look a little bit at this this work of Heath Brown, and um, when you have the semi prime information and, and other stuff, you can really do a lot of sieving and, and other complicated arguments, and um, somehow get this to work. Um, but sort of just you know straight out of the box and and doing it like so. Um, we really aren't able to make, to make much progress. We don't have the same sort of ability to control minor arcs. Um, it's not just a function of the fact that we have two parameters here. It's actually something that's a bit deeper. Um, there are cases where you have two parameters and you can still sort of work around it, um, like the Balog result that I, that I mentioned earlier, stuff like that. Um, it really has to do with the notion of true complexity, which is more intricate in adverse complex arcs, but um, you can sort of think of this as, as a, a basic reason why. You know, if you just try to do these types of L2 arguments, um, parcel, et cetera, you just will, will really have trouble bounding the minor arcs. And there's a good reason for it. Um, not only is no minor arc estimate available for this uh, four-term arithmetic regression situation, um, there are actually functions where the minor arcs uh, play uh, a real role in bounding it. So like in the previous argument I gave, um, the argument is stronger than just O. The prime numbers have these nice minor arc estimates, and so they're nice. Like this really tells you that if I have any function where you know I can exactly control where what's happening on the large Fourier coefficients, I can always just add up those those major arcs, and then the minor arcs are always kind of small in some quantitative sense because I have this inequality which is really generic in the function f. I didn't really use that f was the indicator of the prime numbers, and so there are functions f in these more complicated equations and situations that have these non-trivial minor arc contributions. And so you have to somehow detect those and figure out, okay, how are we going to add those up? Um, they just magically align and something happens. And in fact, um, I can show you one such function, which is really, um, in a sense, the the representative function that you should always keep in mind when you're trying to study things that are, you know, not just amenable to, to Fourier analysis, but still have this sort of complexity um, situation uh, present, or if you're trying to use higher order Fourier analysis. So, uh, let's look at this set. So we take the numbers from 1 to n. We look at n squared root 2 mod 1. Let's say mod 1 is between 0 and 1. And let's look, let's say, at the numbers which are very close to 1 half with an epsilon. Okay. So uh, sort of a classical result, uh, we'll equal distribution. Uh, the set is going to have density 2 epsilon. And there are a lot of nice things you can see about the set. Um, in fact, I mean, also just directly from sort of a Gaussian estimate, although you can also repeat the proof of wheel equal distribution. Um, basically, um, my Fourier coefficients of this indicator function are going to be small, maybe up to like some major arc, or maybe when you're near zero, it's not quite going to be small. But for the most part, like they're going to generically be small. And the mean of the function, which is the zero Fourier coefficient, is going to be two epsilon uh, with a proper normalization. Okay. And n squared root two is you considered mod one, it's a very random function. So you could say, okay, I expect my four APs to be nice, major arcs, minor arcs are small. What gives? So here's what gives. Let's say we know that x, x plus d, and x plus two d are all in my set. Let's say x and d were sort of chosen randomly, and then I reveal this information to you. So if we are in a situation where the minor arcs really didn't contribute. As it turns out, it's sort of a so-called pseudo-random case um, in the sense of, of tau or green tau um, with respect to Fourier coefficients. And as it turns out, what should happen then, um, in a sense, because uh, my Fourier coefficients are small, what should happen if this wasn't an obstruction 
is that this last event should be kind of independent. You should still have sort of a, a probability two epsilon for X plus 3D to also be an S. But it is in fact much more likely for X plus 3D to be in the set now that those three are in. Um, I didn't write the equation explicitly here, but the reason is that if I plug in X, X plus D and X plus 2D into, you know, the, into the square here, and I plug in X plus 3D into the square, they satisfy a linear relation from finite differences. X squared minus 3X plus D squared plus 3X plus 2D squared minus X plus 3D squared is equal to zero. And the same if I multiply by root two. And therefore, if I take fractional parts, if I know three of them are really close, tightly concentrated in this interval, the last one ought to be in an interval, okay, maybe not of epsilon around one half, but maybe like 10 epsilon around one half. And so instead of having an epsilon probability of being in this very tight interval, morally, I'm closer to like a 10% probability, more of an absolute constant. So I have this extra sort of planted correlation from this linear relationship between these quadratic uh, you know, tests in a sense. And this is not picked up by the uniformity of the Fourier transform, by the fact that the Fourier is small in the minor arts and nowhere else, basically. So in particular, if we take this average, it's going to be order epsilon cubed instead of epsilon cubed. Epsilon to the fourth is more like a what we call quasi-random in, in a certain sense, uh, in additive combinatorics. And in general, for k-term progressions, as you can see, we could use a degree up to k minus two polynomial and achieve the same result because of finite differences. And this is really a, a key obstruction in the theory and the reason why it becomes much more complicated than, than just a naive thing. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it is important for understanding why this is really a nil potent theory. Like you could say, oh, let's just look at exponentials of pure polynomials now and try to do some sort of Fourier analysis with it. There are really genuinely more things you can do. Um, and the more things you can do are you can do so-called bracket polynomials of degree up to k minus two. So instead of doing like alpha n squared, we do alpha n times the fractional part of beta n. And then I can nest it even further if I have a higher degree. And these sorts of things, basically, they don't exactly satisfy finite differences, but they satisfy it enough fraction of the time that it causes a real issue. And it still causes the minor arcs to maybe not as purely as the polynomial example here, but still to a reasonable extent and to an extent that really needs to be picked up somehow and accounted for, these can still cause problems. This is an exercise in, in fractional parts and floor functions. It's not the nicest thing to do, but um, one can see it um, by sort of trying to do finite differences with these things and working it up. Kind of like how you prove wheel equidistribution or exponential sum estimates where you use like van der Korpis lemma or something like that. All right. Well, okay. Perhaps I should ask, are there any questions at this point? This is really sort of the key reason and reasoning and motivation for, for what we do um, in the sequel. Okay. So before we were just understanding these Fourier coefficients, which are really like linear phase functions. Um, so here the idea is, okay, I have these quadratic and fractional parts of quadratics and bracket polynomials, why don't we look at how we correlate with these things as well, not just our linear Fourier coefficients and, you know, try to build up a theory. And this is the idea behind higher order Fourier analysis. Um, and so we could look at an average like this one, which is with, you know, the exponential of this bracket instead. And uh, the reason that um, I, I, I call this sort of nil sequence correlations, um, and the reason why, again, this is kind of a nil potent theory, is because as it turns out, these bracket polynomials of degree up to, you know, k minus two or k or whatever, um, can be expressed as so-called nil sequences. Namely, um, I take a nil potent Lie group, G. So it means like it's lower central series, terminates eventually. Um, and so, for example, you can do a lot of group operations by using Baker, Campbell, Hausdorff, and everything terminates and, you know, nested commutators eventually become zero, stuff like that, or trivial. Um, I take a so-called polynomial sequence on my group, and you can just think of the representative case of I take an element and I raise it to the nth power. That would be a linear sequence. And it turns out that this is general enough to do anything you want, but you can also do you know polynomial types of things if, if you want. It makes the theory a bit easier to, to understand. 
um, or to work with rather, maybe not interesting. Um, but this is the representative case. I take gamma, which is a discrete co-compact lattice inside of a group. And then I basically take a function on this quotient, this compact quotient, which is smooth. And I look at this polynomial orbit in the compact quotient, and I evaluate it based on this test function, f. And this is a way, this is some recipe you can cook up to create certain types of functions. And for example, if g is just r, or maybe r to the n, and gamma is just z, or z to the n, and g of n is just this thing, which would just be a linear function, then if f is sort of the exponential function on r mod z, e, then you, you literally just get a regular Fourier phase function out. But if you do more complicated things, like I look at the Eisenberg group of you know, upper triangular um, with diagonals one, three by three matrices, for example, this is a null potent Lie group. I can find a discrete co-compact lattice. I can do this stuff and I can get more generally interesting things, including this example or something that's approximately this example. There might be a smoothness issue. So this is sort of the basis of higher order for analysis is looking at these types of nil sequences or sometimes nil characters um, and correlations with them. Now, of course, it's all well and good to set up all these definitions or, um, and I've sort of uh, glossed over what the precise definitions are, but there's of course an obvious issue. It begs the question, how do you actually use these correlations to say anything um, about our original K-term arithmetic progression counts or, or other types of things that we care about? We don't have Fourier inversion is sort of the key point. Uh, Fourier inversion, for example, if I do it on a uh, you know finite abelian group like Z mod n, there's sort of this fact uh, we have duality, um, and you know there's like a linear algebra fact where I have n characters and the size of the group is n, so you have this perfect sort of correspondence. Everything works out. You have uniqueness of representation, and this leads to so many things that are that are very useful. You have Plancherel, Parseval, etc. Uh, we don't have any of that. In fact, there are way more, in a sense, um, nil sequences than Fourier characters. And of course, here, I've sort of written in a way that there are infinitely many. But um, if you just sort of want a representative class of them, in some sense, there's still way, way more. And so there's no 100% obvious algebraic back and forth that you can do. If you if you open up some of the work of Greenhouse Ziegler and you know use their infinitary version and, and various other things, there are kind of things that you can say. And if you look at the ergodic theory side of the picture, which I'm not really talking about here, um, things like nil, um, you know, characteristic nil factors and stuff like that, there is actually a lot of you know algebraic structure underlying it. Um, but it's in a more subtle way, um, and especially if we want good quantitative bounds, you really have to be able to play both worlds. Okay, so I would certainly certainly be remiss if I did not mention the seminal work of Gowers, um, establishing a new proof of some Reddy's theorem with really genuinely quantitative bounds for the first time. And this these works are sort of the one, this work is really the one that introduces uh, some of the key higher order Fourier analysis tools in out of comedy parts for the first time. All the argumentation that you see, many of it is in a sense styled by uh, many of the arguments that he does, and he introduced many of the fundamental terms. Uh, terms, tools, and and the fundamental norms that we consider the Gower's norm. Uh, admittedly, his proofs sort of are more local in a sense, whereas we really need so-called global information. And so he can kind of get around using these uh, nil potent Lie groups um, because he's only looking at certain local pieces in a sense. Um, and he works primarily with polynomials instead. Um, but as it turns out, still, this is very foundational for, for the field. Okay, so... Sort of with that in mind, let me define now the sort of key objects in the talk, the Gower's norms, and introduce some of the paradigms that, that um, you know, we, we think about here. So I'll take a function which is defined on one through n, complex value, let's say. So the Gower's norm is defined as follows. I'll define the two to the s power, and I'll define it as some sort of average of a degree two to the s polynomial in f. And so it'll be, you know, homogeneous in the appropriate sense. The way I do it is I take a base point on average. I realize, okay, I probably should have said plus or minus n, but let's just think of f as being extended by zeros to the integers. This is also fun. Um, so I take an average or a random base point 
And then I take S different random sort of directions, which are going to be partial derivatives in a sense, or discrete derivatives in a sense. And then I average over the iterated discrete derivative of the function in the sense of a multiplicative discrete derivative. So here I'm going to define delta h of f of x to be f of x times the conjugate of f of x plus h. So if f of x is the exponential of some function like g, then in the exponent, or if I take logs, this is really just looking at g of x minus g of x plus h, which is, let's say, the negative of what one classically thinks of as a discrete derivative. And really, you should think of these f's as, as being some sort of exponential phase functions, or you want to approximate it in some sense by exponentials of bracket polynomials or similar. And so obviously, um, having this differencing can reduce the complexity of these polynomials in a meaningful sense. So, okay, it's not completely obvious, but um, the right-hand side is in fact non-negative um, in general for S at least one. And this becomes a well-defined norm if S is at least two. And when S is one, it's everything except, you know, it's actually a semi-norm because if the average is zero, it can be zero. And this is by an application of Gower's Cauchy-Schwartz, which Gower's introduced. The U2 norm is Fourier analysis. It's intimately related to Fourier analysis. Uh, one can show it's basically up to constants the same as the L4 norm of the Fourier transform. And in fact, it's equivalent in the sense of if one is large, the other is large. If one is small, the other is small to the L infinity of the Fourier transform. Um, for one bounded functions, which is what we're interested in. We're interested in like indicators and prime numbers and stuff like that, or normalized band one man one. Higher values, U3 norm, U4 norm, et cetera, will correspond to higher degrees. So U2 is linear. U3 is quadratic. U4 is cubic and so on and so forth. But of course, you can also have these bracket points that show up at higher degrees. All right, um, so what's the point of this norm? Well. If I have a small Gower's norm, we say that it's a US uniform function. And morally, it's going to behave similar to our minor arc uh, contributions. So if I have a function, all of these Fourier coefficients is small, it's kind of like an error. And in any argument where I'm trying to like count patterns or whatever in this van der Korpet or Vinograd result, we basically just sort of say, okay, it's going to be bounded by something and it's some error term. So similarly, if I change a function by like a small Gower's norm, perturbation, that really shouldn't matter for the purpose of counting my patterns. Or my patterns of complexity at most, you know, estimates numbers. So in a sense, it behaves similar to minor arcs. And okay, perhaps some exercises think, okay, what would make the Gower's norm large? So I'll just say sort of the quintessential example, which is I take the exponential of a pure polynomial of degree S minus one. Then when I take S partial derivatives or discrete multiplicative derivatives um, in a row, I reduce the degree by one every time. So after S minus one partial derivatives, I get to a function that does not depend on X. It might depend on you know, the, the different uh, steps, but it's constant in X. And then I take the final S derivative and I get to E to the zero, which is just the constant function one. And so when I average it, I get one. So among all one-bounded functions, the way to make the Gower's norm the largest is to be the exponential of a pure polynomial. And you can still be pretty large if you're the exponential of a bracket polynomial instead, maybe not exactly one, um, but certainly quite big. So those are sort of the things to keep in mind. We're really detecting the exponentials of polynomials of degree S minus one with this US norm. So, okay, how do we, how do we actually use this? Well, sort of the, end game, in a sense, um, is kind of an arithmetic regularity statement, as it's called. So you would be able to take any function f, maybe it's like one bounded, and I want to be able to write it as f struct plus f unif plus f error. f error is just something that's like small in L2. It's just some um, you know minor error that you can always bound away. f unif is the small Gower's norm stuff. That's sort of the stuff that I said are just minor arc contributions. And f struct is really where all the value is. It would be something like, oh, if I remove all the minor arcs, I'm left with a you know, superposition of major arc Fourier coefficients. And I just, just sum it up and get like a hearty little singular series or whatever. 
um, it's kind of like the major arc contributions. And I want some legitimate structure I can actually use beyond some abstract, oh, this is just the part where it's large. I, I really want something structural. I want it to be really a superposition of bracket polynomial phases now. Now, this is sort of the content of these arithmetic regularity lemmas and to some extent counting lemmas of, of, of Green and Tau and, and later Altman. Um, as it turns out, if you really try to push really hard for this precise decomposition and use an application, you'll lose a lot in bounds. But this is morally what's happening. And usually you can get, get away with uh, not doing something quite as strong as this. But for, for now, before I move on to that part and really motivate the inverse theorems, are there any questions about this? So now I'm going to get more into a bit of the, the technical part of this talk. Um, maybe I'll mention that this is sometimes called a structure pseudo-random error decomposition. Um, you might see this in some of the writings of Terry Tao, for example. So, okay, let me just quickly say how this lets you count higher progressions and then you know talk about what we actually need and, and what an actual inverse theorem is. So, okay, given this decomposition, we want to count four-term arithmetic progressions. We just plug it in and we expand into 81 terms of various types. The pure structure term corresponds to a major arc computation. Instead of just Fourier coefficients, which I compute exactly, I also maybe have some slightly more complicated things. That's fine. I add it all up. The terms involving F error are just going to be small because it's small in L2. I do some like Cauchy Schwartz. The terms involving F unif are small because the Gower's norm of the appropriate size, in this case, it's the u k minus one term for k term arithmetic progressions, controls the k a p operator. So this is sometimes called the four a p operator, um, and in general, you can plug in four different functions. And so here's just sort of an inequality that I'm not really going to explain too much. But basically, if I take a count of k term arithmetic progressions weighted by different functions and let's say they're like L infinity bounded functions, then this average is bounded by the minimal UK minus one norm of any of these functions. So if any of these functions is very uniform in the sense of Gower's, then this average is basically zero. And so it's like an error term. And so here F unif is like some function that morally is kind of averaging to zero. And even if you plug it into this more complicated operator, it's still going to force it to be small. And so we have two error, or we have 80 error terms, and we have one main term. And so that's how we could potentially count this thing. And okay, this, I'll say again, this final inequality is proven using Gower's Cauchy Schwartz, which is, uh, for those who are familiar, kind of an iterated van der Korpis inequality. Okay, so let's talk about inverse theorems for the Gower's norm. So we need to establish our notion of structure. And we want to establish that it really is coming from these bracket polynomials. It's not just this abstract norm that we don't really control. So we need to be able to go between the two. Let's say that our US plus one norm is large. We need to be able to say, let's say, okay, our function is one bounded or something. We need to be able to say something structural about this function. So in one direction, the regular direction, if F course, course correlates with a nil sequence of degree at most S, then the US plus one norm is large by using van der Korpis inequality in many terms. The reverse or the inverse is the content of an inverse theorem. So again, Green Tau Ziegler first established this in generality over uh, the integers. They established it ineffectively, although it turns out that if you plug in enough stuff and unwind enough stuff, you can make it effective, but somewhat poor. It was made effective uh, by manners in 2018 with a double exponential dependence on delta or on one over delta. And of course, uh, our result really makes it a quasi polynomial dependence. And sort of one key uh, reason why this is uh, so great is that if I iterate a quasi polynomial function, it remains quasi polynomial. Uh, whereas if I iterate a double exponential, it becomes quadruple exponential and then uh, six fold, eight fold, 10 fold, et cetera. Okay, so here's the precise statement. We start with a function, which is one bounded. It's US plus one norm is large. Then we have basically a nil sequence in the sense that I kind of 
alluded to earlier on a null manifold of degree s, which basically corresponds to how complex it is, um, how many sort of iterated commutators you need to get to triviality. It's related to that for the most part. There's this complexity parameter, um, which is needed because uh, once you go past just abelian groups like R or R mod Z, um, for example, stuff like your Lie bracket can involve these weird coefficients that might be large numbers. And so you need a complexity notion to control what can happen um, and, and dimension and so on and so forth. And basically I have this thing that I was calling a null sequence and it correlates in the sense of, you know, an inner product to a degree epsilon as an output given an input of a large Gaussian. And we have good bounds, quasi polynomial bounds on the various parameters involved. So that's the statement of the inverse theorem that we proved. Uh, of course, the prior ones basically just either gave ineffective bounds or gave sort of double exponential bounds um, in this sort of red line at the bottom. Okay, so let me just quickly, with maybe uh, you know five minutes that I have left or so, uh, say a bit about the proof ideas, um, which I think are interesting in their own right. I think certainly in many applications you might not really need to open this up, but I think it motivates some of this theory a bit more and you know elucidates a bit more some of the connections that you see in really shows how there are also some algebraic relationships in terms of how we prove these things and also to ergodic theory. So we're going to broadly follow the strategy of green tau Ziegler, uh, the original proof, um, with sort of improved equal distribution inputs and, and better machinery for so-called approximately linear functions. So I'm not going to really elucidate much more on this and just sort of broadly follow um, green tau Ziegler with maybe our parameters plugged in for the most part. So, OK, what is our strategy? Well, I have this very complicated norm which involves taking s plus one partial derivatives of my function and or discrete derivatives and doing some average. So the first step is to use this equality, which basically removes the final derivative and then averages over the remaining ones, like so. So this inner thing basically takes the remaining s derivatives for you. Okay, we have the assumption that our s plus one, us plus one norm is large. So this average over here is large. And for this to be large, there need to be many h such that the inside is somewhat large with some losses maybe. Okay, so many derivatives are large in the us norm, not the us plus one norm. Okay, so we can apply induction. And the base case of like U2 or whatever falls in Fourier numbers. Okay, we have something like this where the derivative correlates with some something and that something might depend on what H is. We don't have a lot of control, but we do know that is degree S minus one in terms of as a nil character or whatever. So again, just think of this as like the exponential of an S minus one degree polynomial if you want. And okay, epsilon is like a polylog loss, which again, uh, when you compose polylogs, you don't, they remain polylogs. So this is not important. Okay, so what do we know now? We know many derivatives of f are structured. And we want to somehow integrate this information into a single correlation for f from correlations of the derivatives. So the key point here is, okay, I have a function. I know all of its derivatives are correlating with things. Morally, the things that the derivatives correlate with should all be coming from the derivative of a single true object. And then that single true object is what I should correlate with. And it should be of one higher degree, so of s. How do we do this, though? These chi h's, as we're calling them, are completely arbitrary. Arbitrary degree s minus 1 polynomial. So as I sort of said, here's the most motivating case. I have a degree s minus 1 polynomial exponential phase function. Um, but the coefficients depend on h. Okay, and the first sort of key step is to linearize the top coefficient. Basically, I want to show this equation that a s minus one h is equal to alpha h for for a lot of h's. Again, there can be some loss here. It's not super important. And actually, more complicatedly, what you can only achieve is something like a um, you know superposition of of brackets instead. Um, due to various technical issues, and this is where these bracket polynomials are coming in um, as one of the cases. But 
really just think about this linearization, uh, pure linearization. Oh, uh, getting ahead of ourselves, but how do we get any structure on this top coefficient or any coefficient? How do we relate these chi h's to each other? Well, we're doing these partial derivatives or whatever, multiplicative derivatives. We have a co-cycle relation that we can use, which is that if I take a partial derivative of the sum of two shifts, I can relate it to partial derivatives where I take the first shift and the second shift. This is just the fact that like, if I jump by h and then jump by h prime, then it's the same as jumping by h plus h prime. Um, and so we have this identity. And OK, because there's some multiplication, this is going to be valid as long as the magnitude of f is 1. So if we think of these as like e to the 2 pi i times something, then this is really just a genuine identity. And somehow we can use this to relate what's happening in h1 and h2 to what's happening in h1 plus h2. And in general, you look at so-called fourfold additive quadruples um, that I won't really get into further. But anyways, using this, you can sort of establish some type of approximate linear structure and really show this for real, for the most part. Once we have that, for these values of h, we can decompose chi h into two parts. The first part is basically, we know exactly what this top term is. And so I'm going to write it as the derivative of something. And then I'm going to cancel out the remainder. So here, this is just sort of the antiderivative of alpha h n to the s minus 1. And these are just some lower order terms that you get when you try to make this identity be true for real. So literally, I've just integrated, in a sense, the polynomial, where h is like dn or something. Now, when I plug this in, this main term is now sort of just something that I can treat as an error term on f. The original function. And I've sort of extracted the most important part of my function. And I have some remainder term on the outside, which is now a remainder term, not of degree s minus one anymore, but in fact of even lower degree, of degree s minus two. And basically, what this ends up meaning is that we can sort of use Gower's Cauchy Schwartz again and show that, okay, if I take s minus two partial derivatives, this thing will just vanish for me. And I have one extra one from, um, let's say, or, okay, I need to take s minus 1 partial derivatives to kill a degree s minus 2 poly. And then I have one more. So really, I can get something like this, where f chi bar is now controlled by the us norm instead of the us plus 1 norm. So originally, f was some degree s plus, or us plus 1 type thing. Morally, it's degree s. This chi is really the top term. And I canceled it out. And now that I've canceled it out, I can legitimately show that the remainder is now us, which morally is degree s minus 1. And in fact, I just apply the inverse theorem one final time. And you know I get that s correlates with chi times something of lower degree. And a product of low degree things, it remains low degree. So that concludes the proof strategy. So as you can see, it's really this sort of really intimately connected with like proofs of wheels inequality, for example. Um, for you know complex phases, equidistribution type things, and and also kind of this weird like integration, um, iterative integration, and we we see this co-cycle stuff show up. And when you look at the ergodic theory picture as well, there's a lot of intimate relations to, to algebraic arguments as well. Um, and of course, I've had to to hide much of that uh, for for the purpose of time. But yeah, that sort of concludes the argument. Uh, concludes sort of uh, you know some of the nice ideas uh, from additive common forks uh, that we see here. Um, so uh, if you want, you can find the paper online, quasi-polynomial bounds on the inverse theorem for the Gower's US plus 1 n norm. And uh, again, thanks for coming. And of course, if there are any further questions, I'm happy to take them.